Yeah, hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, on this beautiful day, we're sitting inside, but it's a beautiful day and uh, the beginning of a bright new academic year. The Utrecht University Center for Global Challenges and Tivoli Vredenburg are very happy to welcome you here for the first annual lecture, Transforming Our Future. And we are very honored and excited that this first Transforming Our Future lecture will be delivered by the honorary professor Carlotta Perez. Unfortunately, it's due to COVID, uh, Professor Perez could not travel, but um, we're very, very happy that um, she's with us online. Let's see if she's there. Welcome, Professor Perez. You are Thank there? Thank you. Oh, you're there, yes. Yes, we're very honored and very happy to have you here, and we're looking forward to your lecture. But first, let me start with handing over to Joost de Laat. And Joost de Laat is the director of the Utrecht University Center for Global Challenges and professor of global economic challenges. His research focuses on reducing inequality in education, and he will now introduce this brand new annual lecture. Joost de Laat. Thank you, uh, Marcia. Welcome, everyone. Uh, it's a, a great pleasure to see you all physically here, even though we can't all be together. Um, welcome, Professor Carlota Perez. Um, it's a great honor to uh, initiate this first annual lecture by the Center for Global Challenges, UGLOBE in short, uh, and to have uh, Professor Perez, who yesterday, as many of you know, I'm sure, um, uh, was bestowed an honorary doctorate by Utrecht University for her work. Uh, it's a great honor to have her be our first uh, speaker as part of this annual series. In a recent lecture, uh, Professor Perez said, let's hope we can understand the moment we are living in. And then, in the rest of her lecture, proceeded to call on, on government, on business leaders, on societal leaders, on the young, on the educated, on society, to shape, in a synergistic way, the technological revolution that we are living in towards a golden age of smart green growth. She will talk a lot, I'm sure, in her lecture about the details of this, and Johan Schott, my colleague, will in a moment introduce her. Um, but that idea of let's um, understand the moment that we are living in and collectively shaping, molding the future towards a golden age, in her words, is a great fit with the Center for Global Challenges. Um, we too want to understand the uh, age that we're living in, and we do that through an interdisciplinary approach. So we work across faculties towards the global challenges of our time. That might be human rights issues, we're working on conflict and security, sustainability, inequality, in teams of scholars, and also of engaged scholars. So we want to understand and confront the challenges of our time through engaged scholarship. We do that through so-called flagship projects, where we as scholars and students, through our community-engaged learning, um, work collectively, collaboratively, as partners with societal stakeholders. These may be governments, these may be NGOs, these may be businesses. Together, in experimental ways, come up with new ideas, new solutions, to make this contribution to the challenges of our time. Carlotta's lecture will be followed by a Q&A and a discussion with yourselves. And uh, we are about engaged scholarship, so I call on you not to only enjoy the lecture, but also engage with uh, uh, Professor Perez and her work. And we are led by, and that's also a great honor, uh, Marcia Lauten. She already introduced the lecture uh, at, at, at the start. I'm sure most of us here know Marcia Lauten. Uh, like Carlotta, she combines economics and history in much of her work. Uh, she's lived in Africa, uh, written extensively about that, but also, for example, about the history of coal mining in, in, in Limburg, here in the Netherlands. Um, she has been active in very uh, uh, fora, newspapers, television, and as she says herself, uh, although the particular forum may differ, she looks for something big and something small. And I hope that today we can also uh, see a little bit of that come through. Um, so welcome everyone, thank you for joining us today, 
uh, and I look forward to what will be a very exciting and interesting lecture and Q&A um, with Carlota Perez here amongst us. Thank you, Joost, and uh, welcome to those who've just entered. We're happy to have you here for this very interesting lecture and Q&A afterwards. Um, to introduce uh, Carlota Perez, there's a man uh, who can do that better than I could. Johan Schott, he's Professor of Global History and Sustainability Transitions, and he's also the Director of the Transformative Innovation Policy Consortium and the Deep Transitions Research Project. And on that research project, um, Schott has been working closely with Carlota Perez. So I think no one is better equipped to introducing the new honorary professor than Johan Schott. Johan. Thank you, Marcia. Um, why is Carlotta Perez so special? And also so special for me? She advances an economics of hope. And I think that's must needed in these times, these troubled times we live in. If you think about the climate crisis, the rising inequalities, the geopolitical conflicts, and of course the pandemic. So we live in troubled times. And how can we think about these troubled times? Uh, her hopes are grounded in her work. And we will hear about her work. Uh, and if you want to know more, she has a very good website. If you Google her, you will find that. Uh, but I would like to mention her seminal book, Technological Revolutions and Finance Capital, Dynamics of Bubbles and Golden Ages. And she's working on a sequel that will come out next year. I'm an historian, and as an historian, already 25, 30 years ago, I was really attracted to her work because she's looking for patterns and regularities in history because she wants to learn from history and she wants to think about the future. Um, she also is a public intellectual. That means she combines experience, practical experience, with study. She has been in Venezuela, where she was born, uh, has been a director of technology, a founding director in the Ministry of Industry, but more recently she also worked with the European Commission In she was chairing the high-level expert group on green growth and jobs. Currently, she is affiliated with University College in London uh, and also with uh, Tallinn University of Technology in Estonia. But more importantly, I think she's also, she is connected to the Science Policy Research Unit the, of the University of Sussex. There, she started under the mentorship of the late Chris Freeman, who became her partner as a research fellow. And I'm sure he would be very proud to see her here, uh, because we are, will be celebrating his work also, Carlotta, uh, later this week. Uh, but here, uh, please uh, listen to the words of Carlotta Perez. Thank you very much, Professor Schott, Johan Schott, my colleague and friend. Uh, this is a great honor. It is really very important for me to have been chosen as the first speaker in this extremely uh, valid, uh, relevant series of talks initiated by Utrecht University, by UGLOBE. So I will try today to talk to you about designing the future, about designing the future, which means designing the transition, because we are in a very important and deep transition. 
we are moving from a world of consumerism, from lifestyles that were marked by excessive waste and by desires that are not necessarily uh, consonant with the planet, the only planet we have. So we must move from that way of living to sustainable ways of living. And that is not going to be easy because it isn't just us. It's everybody. It's everybody all over the world. And it's also every business person. And they have to also change their habits, their ways of looking at their business. So we're making great changes, but we can. And that's what I'm going to try to convince you of today, that it is possible. And it's possible because we can learn from the history of technological revolutions, just as Johan just said. Uh, when we think of the future, one of the sources of inspiration is the past. However, of course, the future is not the continuation of the past, nor is it determined by technology. We shape it. We design it. We give direction to technology. And history is probably the best source of criteria to guide us in the process. So, my talk will have five parts today. We begin with the fact that there have been five technological revolutions, but only four golden ages because we are still, the next one is still ahead. Then we will talk about the social political shaping of technologies, about why smart and green go together and must go together about why FAIR and Global also go together and must go together. And finally, the question of growth. Should we think of degrowth? Why growth? Which growth? That will be the final idea I will try to convey to you. So let's begin with the five technological revolutions and the four golden ages. Five technological revolutions in 240 years. The first one is, of course, the Industrial Revolution, machines, factories, and canals. Canals was the internet of the time. Then from 1829, we have the age of steam, coal, iron, and railways, followed by the age of steam and heavy engineering, electrical, chemical, civil, naval. That was the first globalization, actually, because uh, with the transcontinental railways, the transoceanic telegraph and the steamships, it was possible to have a completely global economy, very similar to the one today, as far as the people of the time were concerned. Equally impressive, equally amazing, but also equally painful because the South suddenly became uh, a threat to the North because agriculture and materials and so on could be brought from abroad very quickly. So we do have a lot of parallels to follow in history. Then in 1908 with Ford's Model T and very soon with the assembly line, we have the age of the automobile, oil, plastics, and mass production. That's the one we're trying to get rid of with the age of information technology and telecommunications, which I say began more or less with the microprocessor in 1971. But we've had the longest, the longest early period of, the, of any revolution. The age of information technology and telecommunications is only halfway along its path. That is not a mistake. That is really what I'm going to try to tell you. And each of these revolutions brings a techno-economic and socio-institutional shift. So it's not just technology. It changes, the, it changes society and it changes institutions. And we need a lot of innovation to make sure that those institutions make that techno-economic shift 
be favorable for society. But what we have is that every revolution has growing inequality in the first half and the golden age in the second one. And that is the main message that I have for you today. The historical record reveals the sequence of bubbles and golden ages. We have a bubble prosperity with increasing inequality, followed by a golden age prosperity, which is a win-win game between business and society. In between, we have post-bubble recession, political unrest, populism, very, very typical that in every one of these mid midway recessions, we have the rise of populism left and right. We are now here. We are just on the verge of golden age prosperity. But what were the previous ones? Well, we have the canal mania, and then after a short recess in that time, the Great British Leap. The second, the railway mania, followed by the Victorian boom. Many global booms, the Gilded Age, as I told you, it was the first globalization, so we had booms in Australia, in Argentina, in South Africa, everywhere in the South because of the new global economy. And after that, we had the Belle Epoque in Europe and the Progressive Era in the US. The fourth, the automobile age, the Roaring Twenties were followed after a long recession, two wars and so on, uh, the Second World War uh, were followed was followed by the post-war golden age, the greatest golden age we have had, of course. And the fifth revolution, the current one, the dot-com boom and the global casino were the two crashes this time. And we might have a sustainable global ICT golden age ahead. We are now on the threshold of that. The golden ages depend on government policy providing direction. And the post-pandemic reconstruction opens an opportunity similar to that after World War II. I want to tell you that for governments to provide that direction, we also need society to push government. Because just as competition moves companies to modernize, it is social support that brings governments to make the necessary changes. Now, it's very important to understand that each golden age enables a different lifestyle. And it's very important for those lifestyles to change each time, because otherwise we don't get, we lose a lot of jobs with every revolution. We lose jobs, skills, regions that, was, that were prosperous no longer are. Many, many destructive changes. Schumpeter called it creative destruction. But there is one very important thing that creates new jobs that allows us to overcome the pain of the transition and that is a different lifestyle. So it's our responsibility also. So how was it? Well, we had urban Victorian living in the second surge, which meant that on the one hand you had manufactured textiles and pottery, but on the other hand, handmade everything else. With the growth of cities, there are services and infrastructures that created lots of employment. Then in the third revolution, the Belle Epoque, cosmopolitan living, we had industrial electricity, paint and materials. We had many industrial things, but at the same time, we had carpets, objects and art from all over the world, tramways, phones, hotels, restaurants, cafes, newspapers, books, theaters, music halls, etc. It was this huge transformation of living outside the home. And then we come to the fourth revolution, the automobile age, the age of oil, of cheap oil and plastics and so on. So we had suburban family living. That's because the automobile allowed the whole territory to be used. Before that, we had the cities and the countryside with the railways in between and lots of cheap land around the cities. As soon as you got far enough, the land, the price of land was very cheap. So that's how we got, thanks to the automobile, to suburban family living, which allowed even workers to have a home full of electrical appliances and a car at the door. 
So all products were manufactured, preferably plastic with the fast assembly line and very high productivity. But the employment came in construction, malls, TV advertising, banks, soda fountains, etc. So there was something outside, but mainly it was the home that became the center for receiving the advertising and for using all the electrical appliances in the kitchen, in the living room, record players, uh, radio, TV, etc. So it was the opposite of the Belle Epoque. And that's what these things are. Every technological revolution, the lifestyle, is almost the opposite of the previous. We had a lot of material-based, energy-based consumption in the family living uh, in the fourth, in the age of mass production. We are now going to have a lot of services, a lot of a complex network of entertainment and, and exploring and exercises and bicycle riding and all the other things that are very different from this suburban home closed model. So we had new demand, new businesses, new jobs, replacing the ones destroyed by technology in each case. And that's what we need to have now. Now, I want to just show you very quickly how different one way of life can be from the other. So this is the emergence of the American way of life as a paradigm shift from the 1910s. It was consolidated as a lifestyle after World War II. So we went from energy scarce living where energy is expensive and often inaccessible, that's the case of the third revolution, to the energy intensive homes and mobility. Energy is cheap and its availability seems to be unlimited. That's what we all believe. So from trains, horses, carriages, stagecoaches, ships and bicycles, to automobiles, buses, trucks, airplanes and motorcycles, all moved by oil, of course. From local newspapers, posters, theaters, parties, to mass media, radio, movies and television. From ice boxes and cold stoves to refrigerators and central heating. From doing housework by hand to doing housework with electrical equipment. From natural materials, cotton, wool, leather, silk, ah, we have to go back to that, to synthetic materials from paper, cardboard, wood, and glass packaging. Again, we have to go back to that, to preference for disposable plastics of all sorts. From fresh food, bought daily from specialized suppliers, to refrigerated, frozen, or preserved food bought in supermarkets. City or country living and working, to suburban living separate from work. All were strongly aided by advertising, business strategies, and government policies. Of course, among the business strategies, we had the well-known uh, planned obsolescence so that products would be thrown out very quickly. So the sociopolitical shaping of technologies. Technology sets the stage and provides the tools. The shaping to bring about the golden age is political. So the outcome depends on social pressure. Civil society, political movements, and thought leaders play a defining role in the outcome. What did we get with the mass production golden age? We got employment, education, health, and security based on home ownership and mass consumption. But we destroyed the environment and excluded the developing world. What could we get with the digital golden age? All of that, but smart and green. Plus, meaning, creativity, social networks, lifelong learning, based on collaboration, access, rental, maintenance, recycling, and reuse. With an improving global society, flourishing on a healthy planet. Income polarization is typical of free market installations and major bubble times. Installation is the ugly period that we've been going through, which uh, when the new technologies install themselves in our minds, install themselves in our habits, install themselves in the territory, uh, internet without internet actually needed to be installed. So that's what happens. And then there are bubbles due to them. So if we look 
at the percent of declared income earned by the top 1% of taxpayers in the US from 1913 to 2018. 1913 is the assembly line, 2018 is a couple of years ago. So here we have that during the roaring 20s and still partly in the <laughs> coming down from the recession, from the bubble in the 1930s in the recession, we had more or less between 15 and 25% of all the income went to the top 1%. And the same thing happened just now, NASDAQ bubble, 2000s bubble, the same thing between 15 and 25% to the top. But when we get to the post-war boom, to the golden age, they only get 10%. They get 10% of a very flourishing economy, so they are equally interested in making money, but it goes to everybody. And that's what makes capitalism legitimate, that what you earn, that those who earn a lot benefit others a lot. Now the question is, are we going to stay up here? I mean, we've been here for quite a long time now. Finance has continued being at the top, which is what, what doesn't happen. Historically, finance gets moved into servicing the real economy. Uh, right now, finance is controlling everything. So will we actually change the situation? And will we then come to a more to a fairer society? Will we have a post-COVID boom, the golden age of information? Well, that is the real question. Golden age deployment periods tend to reverse the inequality process. Will we do it again? This time, the transition is very deep. We need to go from energy intensive to information intensity in production and consumption, from consumerism and waste to conservation, reuse, and recycle, from mainly products to mainly services, from possession to access, from maximum to optimum mobility, from mostly national to increasingly local, supranational, and global governance. So we really need all these layers, and especially the local layer but also global governance, because without that, finance will never uh, lose the grip it has on the world economy. From home-centered to network-centered, from aiming at comfort to aiming at satisfaction, not necessarily discomfort, but basically much more important than just comfort, et cetera, et cetera. So many institutional innovations will be required to facilitate this deep transition. Now, why smart and green together? Well, the energy and materials intensive, unavoidably wasteful mass production revolution that I just described is the main cause of the threats of climate change and resource depletion. So the information revolution with the intangible nature of software and of internet mobility provides the best set of tools to turn products into services and generally re reverse the trends. Smart green lifestyles and production methods must lead the way. I'll give you some examples of, of smart green, which I'm sure you know. We have streamed music and films, online news, digital books. Can you imagine how many trees we can save to help the planet regenerate? Then rental and maintenance of truly durable goods. Imagine if we, if we didn't throw out the durable, the refrigerators and the cookers and all that, if planned obsolescence were over. If we were to demand that every single producer of any of those goods should put all the parts on the web to be able to, uh, to 3D print them and to make them last for 100 years. They definitely can last for 100 years with current technologies. All upgrades would also be put on the web. We would have 3D printed parts and upgrades, uh, ID chips in every product so we know what its history is and we can, buy, we can rent it used, and digital diagnosis, of course. Then computer-guided hydroponic agriculture around cities. 
so that we don't have to bring everything from far away, interactive smart grids to control electricity usage and cost, MOOCs, the famous uh, online courses and other online teaching and learning, flipping the classroom. We have had some experience now and we are now <laughs> using exactly what can be done. So in a way, you know, I, I am here, unfortunately, I wish I were there, but still it was two less crossings on a, on a flight. Virtual events and online work and meetings, which again, we are doing and so on. Now, how about fair and global? Are we sure that this is something that's necessary and not just desirable? Well, of course, there are fundamental humanitarian reasons as well as practical reasons related to peace and profitability. We are all in this together. If the rise in crime, desperate migrations and populism had not convinced the world, the pandemic has. The post-war boom in the advanced world was the result of a fair income distribution in the North that created dynamic demand for, for profitable business. But it kept oil and materials cheap, holding the underdeveloped countries behind. Is that still necessary? Possible measures for a fair global future for the information age. Universal basic income handled with artificial intelligence plus ATMs plus reimbursement as tax for anybody that earns above a certain amount. Good wages for service workers. They're essential for life, as we discovered during the pandemic, and they are also essential for demand. Build many green affordable homes. It's good for jobs, for well-being, and for the environment. Increase the prices of fossil fuels and materials, so it encourages materials and energy saving, and it helps fund development. Set a financial transactions tax for a Marshall Plan to fund development, which will encourage investment and an innovative sector in sustainable, adequate capital goods. In fact, that's one of the main reasons why even capitalism itself, business, is going to be very interested in global growth, in truly getting everybody to develop. It is because there will be demand for adaptable, sustainable capital goods. The more countries develop, the more capital goods are necessary. And they have to be green, both in their use and in their production, so we are, we are opening a completely different relationship as a possibility between the advanced and the developing countries. And of course, the, the more development in every country, the less migrations there will be, and that will be then a big advantage in terms of more stable social relations and so on. Now, why growth? Which growth? Growth? Why? Why is there opposition to growth now? <laughs> For very good reasons. Moved by the greed of some, not the well-being of the many. So that's what people have felt. Of course, we have been in an installation period for for decades, that's a lot of time. Normally it has been 10, 20, 25, 30 years. This is the longest installation period we have had, the longest period of, of increasing inequality. Of course, capitalism is not a system that's made for equality naturally, but it can be pushed to be more and more equal. But every time the technological revolution comes, historically, it has made inequality worse. It's only the golden ages that reverse the process and actually go further up. Highly destructive of the planet, wasteful, that we know, we've been talking about it today, aimed at excessive consumption, not self-improvement. But poverty in the world cannot be overcome without growth. And now, when globalization has destroyed so many jobs in the advanced world and has destroyed so many hopes, so many futures, then we need growth 
to be able to confront all those things. However, growth just like that or a different type of growth. Which growth? One that aims at education, experiences, and healthy lives. Of course, you know, if we're measuring by GDP, it doesn't measure a lot of the things that are worthwhile, like a woman's work in the home. Now, fortunately, both men and women work in the home, but it doesn't count in GDP. Or many services, care, and all sorts of things that are not in there. So it's not GDP that, that we're not talking about GDP. We're talking about real growth. We're talking about growth in education, experiences, healthy lives, growth that replaces tangible goods with intangible services, that uses biodegradable materials and no waste, hardly any waste, and uses waste again to make it into something else, that aims at dematerialized consumption, that makes and maintains durable products for 100 years. And of course, if it's rented, the poorer can enter the consumption ladder much sooner because you can probably rent a refrigerator for a dollar or a pound or a euro a month because they would be taken care of for a long, long time and you don't have to. So, so they can still be used even though they're very old, so people can enter much more quickly. And of course, growth that aims at eliminating poverty across the planet. So yes, growth, but a very different human-centered type of growth. We must set up a positive sum game between business and society, between advanced, emerging, and developing countries, and between humanity and the planet. And the post-pandemic reconstruction is the best moment to do so. And we can. Thank you. Yes, Professor. Um Pérez, thank you so much for this very rich and inspiring lecture. And um, uh, if I speak for myself, it raises so many questions and, and topics for discussion. So uh, I hope that like the 40 minutes we have will do. Um, let me start with, um, with a very broad question. I was wondering, um, uh, you picture this, um, this sequence of revolutions and patterns and I was wondering, um, do you really suggest that each revolution has the same pattern, saying boom, bubble, bust, crisis, transformation, and then a golden age? I was wondering um, whether that would equally go for, this, uh, for the revolution we are in now, because we've been in this installation period for four decades. Yes. Yes, I think so, because the reasons why it happens that way is because of the nature of capitalism. You see, uh, what, what keeps together a decent period of growth is the fact that uh, all participants share the same paradigm, the same logic, the same uh, way of innovating, the same types of products that they know that people will want, the same way to improve them, the same additional products. I mean, once you start with the refrigerator, the vacuum cleaner, and so on, then you start with the with the osterizer, and you you know you, there is this logic that follows innovation and capitalism. This time we have a very major break. So the usual breaks were big enough. This one is much bigger. So because this one is much bigger, it has lasted much longer. Because this one is global, it has also taken much longer to go through the world. And because this one is, uh, yeah, covers a different area. It used to be manual work in every case or going deeper into nature. When we learned about chemistry, for instance, plastics are the result 
of our having learned how to go into nature and play with molecules practically. This was something that could not be done 100 years before. So there was a long process of transforming, of transformation based on that. Now we have one that is changing a lot more because it is replacing not just manual work, not just materials, which is what uh, chemistry allowed us to do. It is transforming how we work, how we relate to nature, how, how we learn, how we communicate in a very deep way because it has to do with mental work. So we're probably going to have to learn a different way of relating, a different way, and probably less hours. We will have to change many, many more things. But the, the essential nature is that the system has an inertia. People learn to do things in a particular way. We all know about the expression dinosaurs used by the young to refer to the old people who keep on thinking the old way. Well, uh, this time, we're all dinosaurs in a way, and this whole process, and especially the institutions, especially the way governments work, all the bureaucracy, you know, companies have, have many, many companies, the most advanced of them, have replaced the bureaucratic way of relating, and they now relate in a different way. They empower a lot of units. There, there's a deep decomposition of the whole value chain. There are many things that are happening and those changes are enormous. But there is one thing that made this particular revolution last longer. And it is that with globalization, it was possible to move a completely mature technology that should have been abandoned, went all the way to where labor was very, very cheap and that allowed the information, the mass production revolution to last much longer than it should have and did not let the new revolution uh, sort of come fully. Yeah. And finally, as I mentioned, we have not been able, for all those reasons, we have not been able to get finance out of the seat, out of the control seat. We need to put production and government at that seat and have finance serve those purposes. And that's a big difficult thing now that it so happens that information technology uh, made finance much more powerful yeah. and free of controls because all controls are national and finance works transnationally. So we need a supranational body that would be capable of stopping finance from controlling the economy and keeping it going, just financing finance. No, that is but anyway, sorry for the long answer, but your question was a very important question. No, no, no. Um, but because also in the answer, there are again so many interesting <laughs> points. You mentioned the nature of capitalism, and of course you end your answer with um, uh, mentioning the nature of finance that has such a stronghold globally. Um, and that's what I wanted to ask you, because if we look at... Um, Politics, politics has, of course, very, is very much serving uh, this global finance, is serving co big corporations. Um, that makes um, the nature of capitalism has become that politicians and um, uh, shareholders uh, they are well, they're dominated by short-termism, if I can call it that way. They're hunting uh, quick wins, huh? judging their decisions on key performance indicators, be them. Um, election results, or be it um, shareholder value. And uh, I was wondering what could now break the force of that logic, because um, these people, and of course the elites that have the shareholders that gain from this situation, they're reluctant to give up that, um, that position. Yes, and that is, that is normal. That's what, what they will do, but this time, the notion of shareholder value has become much, much stronger and we need to stop it. But there are some good news. Number one good news is the pandemic, which is bad news in health terms, but very good news in terms of what governments think they can do. And what businesses showed they needed government to do, because the first thing they did as soon as the pandemic hit 
was to go to government and ask for help. So now governments will not go back to inaction. That's, that's over, that, that's finished. That's one good thing. I mean, they will still, the free marketeers will still fight and will still try to stop governments from coming back. But it's over. The Green Deal, the Green New Deal, the, the, the just transition, whatever, funding and all sorts of things are happening. And, uh, and the Democrats in the U.S. are also trying that everybody is now conscious of the fact that this game, the way it was played, is over. But, But sorry, then there sorry are things to that are happening in the stock market. Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt because you said COVID is also good news because um, the government um, had to be like a strong state intervening like it hadn't done before until um, since back to World War II. But at the same time, I remember one and a half year ago when COVID started, there was so much appeal for governments to have that transformation, to build back better, to have a green recovery. And now that we are getting out of this economic crisis, you can just see that um, we're getting back to business as usual with um, greenhouse uh, gas emissions, um, uh, carbon emissions, they are rising and we have missed that transformation, haven't we? Well, I don't think it could have been done in the middle of the pandemic. It's happening now. I mean, the, the, the Green New Deal in the in the EU has already been declared, there's plenty of money being put through, there's money for the transition, for the just transition, so there is money to compensate the, the sufferers, that's a very important part of it. We need to do a green transition that takes step by step as quickly as possible, but starting by the ones that create jobs and ending with the ones that destroy jobs, except in the case of energy where we need to go fast, whatever the cost, and then pick up the people and, and do something uh, about jobs. But anyway, the thing is that uh, it couldn't be done before. What, what's important is that, state, that government cannot go back to the way it was before because nobody is going to say that the government should get out of the way. I mean, they will say it, but they cannot, but, but people will realize that if it hadn't been for the government, uh, you know, All the, all the jobs lost, all the companies would have been, it would have been catastrophic. The fact that governments came in and didn't even, didn't think, they just put the money forward because they realized that the whole economy was going to be destroyed. I think that is already something that very difficult to come back. But there are other things happening. Uh, things like corporations B, like the triple bottom line, like the ESG, the environment, uh, society and governance, uh, you know, people are disinvesting from the companies that don't go green and investment is going like crazy. It's going into the green things very, very, even on thinking, you know, like Tesla has become this huge thing just because it's an electric car, even though electricity grids are not ready for that and it will probably end up in having more emissions if we hurry it too much. But anyway, we should go to other things perhaps. But that's not the problem. I'm talking about the importance of the change of attitude of investors, the change of attitudes in the stock market. Things like those two people that were forced into the board of Exxon two green people in the board of Exxon now. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be... Uh, Uh, laws in the Netherlands, they, they passed the law for Shell that it wasn't fulfilling. I can't remember exactly how it was, but it's also, there are many, many things happening and it's only now that they can accelerate because before we just have to take care of the lockdowns and all those things. So I do think that, and, and so many people now have talked about the shareholder value not being the thing. So people are talking about stakeholder value, even the Davos thing, the Davos meeting where all these big capitalists and big financial guys are going, they have to now say that they are green. Some are greenwashed, but some are really convinced. And that's how, that's how changes happen. Changes don't just happen with everybody just flipping like you're, like you're turning over a page. Changes are very complex social processes where 
conviction. You know, Black Lives Matter became, uh, uh, you know, at first it was just a little thing and then a little more and then a little more. And then suddenly we had demonstrations of hundreds of thousands of people all over the world. You know, that's how change happens. So we are now at the threshold of major change and we've just got to have to push it. We've got to do more because we've never had a better opportunity. Yeah, this is the best we've ever had. Because that's interesting. You say technology creates like the opportunity, but then we need uh, social pressure and, um, uh, and dramatic different policies. But if we look at social pressure, you see that soft power has actually diminished instead of grown. Although, indeed, the example of Black Lives Matter is a very good one um, uh, of the other side. But how, what do you feel, what social pressure would be needed now and who would have to come into action to help push this transformation? All of us. <laughs> In what way? Well, what should we do? Well, I mean, there are so many things that we already know how to do, like demonstrations and writing and, and social media and, and change our own behavior and uh, publish things against companies that do the wrong thing. Uh, do, you know, all the things that we always do, but we have to do more of it because this is the best opportunity we've ever had. And we also have to get allies. There is one thing that I think is very important. You know, this green thing, for some, for obvious reasons, has become a bit left-wing. So, you know, we all think, I mean, I just showed you that I, I gave you a left-wing presentation saying that, you know, we have to do both. Uh, it's the Green New Deal. It's not the Green Deal. It's the New Deal meaning social also. Yeah. So, of course, uh, that's something that we can hardly avoid. And in fact, it, it's okay. I mean, we're saying there are two wrong things. One is the social and the other is the environmental. But we should not be against the right when it holds it. And I have seen so many left-wing people getting angry because that's not right. They're not true. They're not. No. If they make money doing the right thing, go ahead and make money and we will fight you on the social things some other, in some other place. We need alliance with the powerful. If we don't have an alliance with the powerful, we will just be loud voices. We need to accept that the changes that the right is doing, that the financial people are doing, we need to accept that, that, they, are, that they can be real. And they will be real if and only if governments make it. So really the real key is the government. Because if they start changing taxes, imagine that taxes were to change so that instead of taxing VAT, which is salaries and profits, we were to tax materials, transport and energy. It would immediately change the playing field. It would immediately change markets and we would have the right on our side because they would never be able to make enough money if they don't go green because that's what would be the most advantageous for them and the less uh, in all sorts of ways. So basically, we need to move that key. And that key is moved by government and that key is moved by politics. We have to vote for the political parties that have the right policies, but not necessarily uh, push the ones that will exclude the, anybody. We have to have everybody. Anybody who has interest in green for whatever reason, and we have to change the playing field, change the conditions, government has to change the direction in which best profits are made. And that will make all the difference. Thank you. Let me move to the audience, because we've got an audience full of scholars, students, professors. Is there anyone who has a question for Professor Perez? Yes, you raise your hand. If you just... Uh, Tell me your question, I will repeat it so she, she can hear it. Yes, Professor Perez, the question here is, um, we've seen every, every golden age had its own particular problems. Uh, what do you foresee as the major problems um, in the golden age that hopefully is there to come, the golden age of the information age? 
Well, there are some things that are in the nature of the golden age, like, for instance, as I said before, the mass production revolution in its nature favored the advanced world because what it wanted was to lift the blue collar workers also into consumption so you could have enough demand for mass production, which depended on as many identical units as possible. And that needed high salaries and low cost energy and raw materials. So of course, the, the separation between North and South became stronger than ever. Now, it could be that that difference would be reduced and because even the big companies would be interested in the development of the developing countries of the South, of the global South. So it is no longer, that is no longer the main problem, although it will go slowly because habits die slowly and because there haven't, there haven't been policies, like I was saying, like a Marshall Plan to fund green development in the South and things like that, which would allow, which would facilitate a process which is, which is opening. It's, it's there. The possibilities are there. I think the problem is that we have not learned to live in diversity, that uh, this paradigm is actually capable of catering to diversity, whereas the previous was very much about homogenizing Everybody had to wear the same type of clothes and, and go with the fashion and all the buildings were the same. I mean, I remember being shocked that in my city in Caracas, in Venezuela, where the temperature is, you know, average temperature, probably 24, 25 and sometimes over 30 and in some cities much more, we were building glass and steel skyscrapers which were completely absurd in terms of the climate. You know, there, there were many designs by architects in the past that had shown how to make buildings like that. So that was, it was really pushing everybody to be the same so that we could get mass production and mass uh, consumption for everybody. So even with the differences in the North and South, consumption of the layer that could consume was the same as the North. I think the question of diversity, the question of all, you know, if the whole world actually starts to develop, then the, uh, the clashes between religions, between ethnic groups, between all those things, I don't think we have a good uh, institutional framework to allow further peace, more differences. You know, we could now, we now have, uh, in Spain, the Catalans speak Catalan and the Bascans speak Basque and so on. And, you know, it, it was impossible in mass production. That was repressed. Now it's open. But as it opens, we have not at the same time created conditions for avoiding conflicts and wars. So I think stopping war between local wars, as Mary Caldo would call them, you know, those actual, more um, ethnic differences and these sorts of things, I think, might become very important. Yes. And, but we can face them. We could improve the whole situation by making, by allowing the diversity to flourish rather than to become a source of difference. And generally, the reason why it becomes a source of conflict is because one group wants to govern and control the other. We need to learn to live together. And I don't know if this paradigm is good enough to help us do that. Yeah, um, uh, you mentioned that um, strong institutional framework was very, very important for the, uh, for the golden age um, after World War II. Uh, and then you uh, point to the World Bank, the IMF, so the Bretton Woods institutions, to the UN, the GATT. Um, you say uh, an institutional stream framework is, is necessary for a new golden age to occur, but um, do you feel that uh, today we are also at the brink of developing a new institutional framework as that of post-World War II is nearly dead, I dare say? Well, uh, the first thing we have to recognize is the nature of all those institutions. Basically, they were uh, 
coalitions of, of national governments rather than supranational institutions. They had no power whatsoever. In, as a supranational power, they didn't have any. The European Union is one first attempt, and yet there is a lot of resistance. You know, nationalism as a force is another big problem. That's part of what I was just saying in terms of, of differences. You know, we have not accepted that we have to be together in our difference. Each differential, whatever, each difference between us should be able to, to survive and to thrive, but also with supranational institutions. We should have all the way to the local and all the way to supranational with teeth, with power. But do you feel... If we don't have a supranational institution that can control world finance, we will never get the system. Yeah. them right. That is indispensable to have a supranational body that controls the, the well, you know, the tax avoidance has become so enormous. I mean, it's, it's grown to in, that, in unimaginable proportions that has got to be controlled. And, and we have to do that. Now, how do we get countries? We can't even get the European Union to stay together. I don't know. So that's that's my problem. That's what I see as the big, big difficulty. That is a huge challenge, probably, huh? with rising nationalism uh, to get powerful supranational institutions with teeth, as you said. But let me move to the audience because I'm sure there are more questions for Professor mm -hmm. Perez. Yes, um, there is a question, Professor Perez. Um, you mentioned we are shifting, we have to shift from comfort to satisfaction. The question is, what exactly do you mean by satisfaction? <laughs> That's a very good question. Uh, I guess one of the things that every, every golden age does is to change the aspirational model of what we think is the good life. We are much more malleable than we think. You know, our ideas today and our ideas 50 years ago, I remember myself when I was in the 1950s, I was in a boarding school uh, and we had a uniform with a white shirt and that white shirt had to be perfect, beautiful. Well, when nylon came, we loved it because we could just wash it at night and the next day it was perfect, it was dry, it was beautiful, we didn't have to iron. Ironing was horrible. So we didn't realize that we were hot. It, it never occurred to us that we could, I mean, I can't remember that problem. And today I wouldn't wear a nylon shirt for, to, to save my life, you know? So we are, we somehow, think that what's good, what's good changes with time. What we think is good changes with time, except things like, like uh, being kind to other people and things like that. But I'm talking about our way of life, the things that we think are satisfying. What satisfies us is not necessarily the same thing as before. I remember uh, in the 1970s, uh, food in Britain was horrible, really, really bad. Today, it is excellent. They have the best imaginable food. They've learned from every single, from the French first and then from everybody else. And food in England is now excellent. But they used to think that their food was good. And you just learn. <laughs> so I don't know if these examples are any good for you, but the, the whole idea that we, that we have a different model of what the good life is, with every technological revolution can be proven, you know, with examples, with many, many examples. First of all, how could we live without mobile phones? Is that comfort or is that satisfaction? Can we even imagine not having a computer? How could we write a letter? I remember typing, plum, 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 plum and then having to type it again from the beginning whenever I change the paragraph. Can you imagine going back to that? All so, that, yeah. But all that has become a romantic, hasn't it? 
being without a mobile phone, people don't watch at their screens. It's romantic, writing a handwritten letter. It's romance, isn't it? <laughs> well, how many, how many young people would feel that it's romantic? I not, don't know. Not many, but who knows? <laughs> Maybe back. <laughs> Let me see. There are a few more questions, so I move on. Yes, please. Okay. Well, that's an easy question. Professor Perez, the Bitcoin, according to you, is that comfort or is the Bitcoin satisfaction? Oh, I think Bitcoin is a, it's not a very good thing. It's uh, whoever, maybe some people find it satisfaction and maybe some people find it comfort, but I think that's a very serious thing. I don't think that's going to change very much. And I think it is allowing many um, shady things to happen. It, they cannot stop it. So I don't think that anything that facilitates the work of money launderers or anybody else is, is a good thing. And it, I don't know, it might satisfy the money launderers, yes. I also think lots of people believe in this thing as if it were this wonderful new uh, invention that will change, that will make us freer, it'll be a libertarian dream and so on. I don't believe in it. Unfortunately, the Bitcoin people think, seem to think that my theory supports them. It doesn't, but I have not been able to stop them. Even giving talks in their big events and saying it's not true, it's, it's all that's not the case. I cannot get them to stop believing that. So maybe that's why this question came up. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes, please. Let me see if I can translate this question. Um, She's saying social media have brought us a lot of satisfaction, but at the same time, uh, um, it is also there's also there it's there's also a, a growing need for regulation uh, of social media. Um, there are issues of of privacy. Uh, what is your view on the role of social media? I think it is wonderful and terrible at the same time. I think for human beings to be able to communicate in wide ranging networks and to learn about each other and to, com and to form all sorts of associations and all that I think is wonderful. I think it's horrible that it's turned into a machine for making money by using people's data. I think we have to uh, invent some institution that will allow us to, to take uh, social control of these of this data you know yeah. the, the new oil as some people call it so i think that we i i don't think we should eliminate social media i think it's a wonderful thing but we need to find an appropriate way of regulating it and of using it so it cannot do as much harm as it can i mean obviously there are all sorts of things having to do with sex among young children, uh, all, all sorts of horrible yeah. things and also, together course, with the fact that we have the, the data, the personal data and privacy problem. So again, you know, only people who are tech savvy are capable of imagining the proper way of doing that. We, you know, we think of the way of doing it like cutting it up, you know, chopping up or, or doing or forbidding or whatever. We need to have technology savvy people who are capable of thinking of the precise way in which we could regulate and, uh, social media and, and still conserve, preserve its social value. Thank you. Um, there were more questions. Let me move to this side. Yes, please. I'll um, translate along the way. Um, she is saying um, the way you present the revolutions was very northern based. She likes what she likes about your talk is that we have to pressure our governments towards more equality. <laughs> then she said, in, in pushing for the technological uh, uh, revolution, governments always had a stake, but uh, that is different in African countries where governments don't have a stake, don't have an interest in pushing for their technological revolution. So the question uh, boils down to this. Uh, how can we expect, uh, for example, African governments to help that transition as they don't have any interest in, uh, in this new golden age? Hmm. 
Okay, I think there is a lot in that question that's, that's important to say. The very first thing is that capitalism is not an even system, and it is true that what I am explaining is what happens in the core of the system. Now, capitalism works in such a way that you have a core, a group of core countries. With every revolution, the, the leading country maybe changes, like the first two are mainly Britain, and, the, and by the third, the US and Germany uh, went ahead, but at the same time, Sweden and Japan and several other European countries incorporated. By the fourth, we had the whole of Europe together with the, with the US and, and uh, Australia, New Zealand, etc., which had begun to develop somewhat in the third and, uh, and so on. So, so capitalism spreads and it moves around. It doesn't really uh, sort of happen in the same way. So that, for instance, when I say installation and then deployment and golden ages and so on, that is not how we can describe other countries. Just to give you a very recent example, uh, the four tigers, the four Asian tigers, Taiwan, uh, Korea, Hong Kong, and Singapore, they made a huge leap into development, and they are today developed countries, having been, de in fact, South Korea was a very poor country, in, in, even in the 1960s, very poor. And now it's, it's up there, it's a developed country. That happened precisely because when a technological revolution occurs, those that are way behind can, if they have certain conditions, make the leap. And that's what happened with those four countries. It also happened that Japan, which had been defeated in the war and hadn't really been able to, able to recover, was able to pick up mass production to transform it with all its just in time and all sorts of methods which it got from to Americans that weren't, that Americans were not interested in, but the Japanese were. And Japan went and became number two until China copying and using all those things and bringing in investment from abroad and technology from abroad became number two and might sometime become number one. So this movement between countries is a very typical process of capitalism and each one of the revolutions has opportunities. The, the import substitution model that Latin American countries used to, to make somewhat of a leap, not into development, but to improvement, to creating a middle class and various other things happened when the technologies from the North had matured, they couldn't increase their productivity and they started by uh, exporting parts and having them assembled in Latin American countries, then that moved to the other continents and then the Asians actually made a much bigger leap. But that depends on, on this whole story. So it's a much more complex story. So now let me go to Africa. Africa has been the one that has remained furthest behind, possibly uh, the colonial past lasted much longer than in other parts, it's only it's only precisely in the fourth surge after the Second World War that slowly, in one way or another, most of them became independent. Uh, I also think that some dreams of socialism were broken by thinking that it just meant take away things from everybody, something like what happened in Zimbabwe, that you just take away from the ones who know how to use the land because they have been exploiting people give it to some that don't know how to use the land and maybe they won't exploit people. Uh, it's not so clear that they won't, but uh, they, they got to a point where they have poverty, inflation, uh, and they didn't get anywhere doing that. So somehow we, we don't yet know how to get out of underdevelopment in, a, in an independent way. And what has happened is that most governments in Africa, uh, well, quite, yeah, most governments in Africa do have a level of corruption that makes it very difficult to make a transformation. How do we change that? Well, obviously only the people of each country can, 
but, uh, but they have to be given the opportunity. And that's precisely why this whole idea of having a Marshall Plan, you know, Europe got reconstructed. Of course, they have the education and all these things. This time we have to also help with education much wider because, of course, every African country has quite a layer of educated middle class, but, but an enormous amount of not necessarily well-educated or capable of, of being entrepreneurial or of being or of working in more complex things. So, so we, need, we need to think and we need to follow the many examples because there are many successful examples in Africa. The thing is that they have not disseminated. Again, we're talking about this need to, to learn from each other and, to, and to, spread, to spread the experiences. But of course, and Latin America now is full of dictatorship. You know, it's also at least full of populism. We have regressed. Mm. Yeah. So it's, it's not easy. I mean, this is, this is not a theory that's really nice and clean. It's only... Yeah. It's, it has many layers of understanding and obviously one of the more complex things are and, is and, under development. Yeah. And yeah, so there are quite some hurdles, but <clears throat> at the same time, um, you've given us quite some inspirational thoughts about transforming our future. And I already said so in the beginning, uh, I was afraid we would, we would run we would run short of time with your theory being so rich, both being broad and very deep and so historical. But it was a very, very inspiring uh, uh, one and a half hours. So, um, Professor Perez, thank you so much for, um, for your contribution, for sharing your thoughts. And of course, we very much hope to see you back here in Utrecht. Um, to our audience, thank you for joining in. Thank you for participating. Um, there's a drink to celebrate this occasion afterwards. And uh, for now, uh, thank you and have a lovely evening. Bye. Thank you also.